Hi, I'm Justy. Welcome back to The Skeptheist, an ongoing series of videos in which I discuss the concepts of science and philosophy. Who am I? Well, that's actually irrelevant for the purposes of tonight's conversation. But if you're interested, here's the sort of thing I like to do. Check this out! New. Now that's out of the way, let's talk about ichthyism and entheism. As you might recall from episode 1, an ichthyist is somebody who believes that before a meaningful debate about the existence of God can take place, we must first very carefully define what is meant by the term God. Now in the first episode I talked about deism and theism, but I didn't touch on other subjects such as polytheism and monotheism. And I'm not going to do that tonight. Instead, I'm going to present two major ideas. One is choosing one's words very carefully, and the other is the idea of entheism. One of my motivations for being an ichthyist is that I sincerely believe that a lot of unnecessary debates and arguments can be avoided by correctly defining the term of God. Indeed, I believe that this concept is true generally. Most of you would be aware of the fairly fruitless exercise of trying to define words in the dictionary based on other words in the dictionary. A symbolic dictionary definition of words is, is inadequate for, um, say, a computer program uh, to form a conceptual net of what those words meant. So what are we to do about the ambiguity of language? On the one hand, we can't sit there and twiddle our thumbs while we define our own definitions of words to each other and, and ensure that they're on the same page. But on the other hand, of course, we don't want to have this ambiguity in our conversation because it can lead to confusion and a lack of progress. Well, one possible solution to this that I see in trying to be more careful about what we say is to be a bit more precise about what we say and employ a formalism known as propositional logic. Now, propositional logic might sound very geeky at first, but I think you'll find that we use it anyway without realizing. So I'll give you an example. If I made the assertion politicians are liars, we could divide that straight away into two categories. I could mean some politicians are liars, or I could mean all politicians are liars. In the some category, there's some wiggle room there as well. I could mean a small number of politicians are liars, or a large number of politicians are liars. And unfortunately, all of those categories tend to lump into the, the assertion I made, which was politicians are liars. Then we could add the extra dimension of context. So um, some politicians lie some of the time, all politicians lie some of the time. Some politicians lie all of the time, all politicians lie all of the time. Even just a simple uh, um, assertion like politicians lie or politicians are liars could potentially mean any number of those combinations. So I think it's important to be acutely aware of what you actually intend to say and ensure that that is what you actually say all of the time, not some of the time. <laughs> So I've got a piece of mental chewing gum for you tonight, which I like to call entheism. For my master's thesis, which is called A Framework for Representing Virtual Worlds, I started with two axioms, which was a world can contain objects, and objects that are appropriately configured can contain virtual worlds. And then from those two axioms, you could have an infinite number of um, in, uh, recursive containment. So uh, to describe our world, if we start with our world as it is made of atoms, and those atoms, when correctly configured, can make computers, for example, and those computers have virtual worlds within them. Those virtual worlds can contain virtual objects, so they're not atoms anymore, obviously, they're, they're data structures. And in turn, those data structures can contain further virtual worlds. It's no surprise that I think of um, entheism in, in this way, that uh, I could apply the same framework to us. So instead of just looking within virtual worlds that are contained within our world, we could posit some other world outside us. And, and as I say, this does not need to necessarily include a supernatural concept. Straight away, we could draw up some basic rules for this kind of construction of universes. Um, it, it, it generally, I'd say, has to, in its innermost level, have a natural world. I'll, I'll use world and universe interchangeably here. So a natural world on, on the inside. Then it could be natural or supernatural around, around that. Uh, if it's natural, you can have subsequent natural layers outside of that. But if it's supernatural, it must be supernatural from that point on. And I even, I even doubt the, this, the logical sense, not the possibility in terms of whether it exists or not, but even the logical sense of something supernatural being created by something supernatural. I suppose that could, that could be allowed, but uh, it's, it, this, this, see, this is why I'm an atheist, because these, these sorts of arguments very quickly break down in terms of the powers that gods might have. So that's the simplest situation, that's an N of 1. Then you could go to the traditional theistic point, or even deistic point of view, 
where there's a supernatural creator made the world come into being or the universe come into being and then uh, either bug it off or stayed around to you know wag the finger at um, behaviors of certain disparate groups of people. Uh, and that would be an N of two because you have a supernatural entity and a natural um, universe that is its creation. You could also have uh, an, an N of two if you had a situation in which we are in our universe, we have no way ever, and I don't just mean we're limited by technology, I mean um, by design, we are limited to be within that universe because our universe is simply a petri dish experiment for some higher um, even calling them alien might not be the best uh, term, but some very much higher level being, a colossus, if you will, that has us completely contained within an experiment. So you could then say, well, you could have an N of three. So you could have us, our um, alien benefactors of which we can never be aware. That's the defining difference, by the way, to add another N to this. If it's just um, another race of being somewhere in the universe that's contained our solar system in a bubble, a la a Greg Egan sci-fi novel, then that's not really an N of two, that's still an N of one. It's still stuff happening in the same universe. But I'm talking about a, a world that's created just for our benefit, with purely naturalistic causes, it has to be said. So perhaps a virtual world, you could you could call it that. Um, it could be software. That's still natural, even though it's virtual. It's, it's not supernatural. Um, but to get another N in there, another universe, you have to have that defining, uh, in this paradigm that I've just made up, you have to have another layer in there. But then you could have an N of three, so it's us, our alien creators, and then a supernatural creator of, of them, of which they are never aware. And I think that distinction still holds, especially back to the case of, of uh, thinking about a theistic God. I mean, despite the continual claims of theists that, that God's present can, presence can be felt, it has to be said that uh, this agency called God does a really good impression of not being there at all, um, leaving the universe in a way such that we can never detect um, his. I find that ridiculous, by the way, but we can never detect its presence. So if that were to be true, and as an atheist, it's not an, you know, it's not an agnostic idea, by the way, but even as an atheist, I'm a skeptic and I have some doubt of the things that I know. I only know them to a certain level of certainty. So I leave, you know, maybe 0.001%. It has to be said, uh, rationality is based on the word ratio, and the ratio of doubt that I have is proportionate to the extravagance of the claim. So the extravagance of the claim of a undetectable agency that sits outside of our universe and makes us, um, you know, that's such an extravagant claim that the level of doubt that I reserve for it is understandably and justifiably very, very small. But it's still there, because it, it, could, it could happen. I've got no way of knowing that. And that's what got me thinking about this entheism, is that I can probably be safe in living my life as though there is no such creator out there. So if this seems like an abstract idea, it's because, well, basically it is. But I think it's a useful mental exercise to go through. This framework does map quite neatly to all of the possible um, situations that, that I've discovered anyway, i.e. there is no God, or there is a God, that, that, that basic um, division. And it goes further than that, that, that um, if, we, if we say initially, okay, there's no God that we're aware of, but there could be something outside um, that we're not aware, that we cannot detect, well, that could also be natural, or it could be supernatural, in, in which case you could call it God. But if it's, even if it's natural, we could just keep going on these layers out and out and out. And Occam's razor, of course, um, dismisses them straight away. Um, so why go on? So I was thinking the other day about how amazing it is to... <gasps> so I think it's... A...